The land. What's the land? The land is a place of victory and rest. That's what the land is. Victory and rest. We'll show you that. We'll see that. We're going to look at that. Father, we ask you to bless us today as we go forward. As we read your word. Give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. Make our hearts open. Understanding. Stop anything that would clog it up. Let us look past all the preconceived notions and ideas that we already have. Some of us came into this deal with all kinds of prejudice and preconceived ideas about how things are supposed to be. Some of us came into Christ Jesus just like we are. I was an American heathen. I used a Catholic, but not too much of it. You saved us. Every one of us. And if you're listening to this and you're not born again, get born again. Don't take long. Just talk to Jesus. He'll do it. We ask in Jesus' name, Father. Amen and amen. So the land. What is the land? We've been studying about the land and wilderness and going in and coming out and staying in. And what do we do and how do we do it? You go by the word. And not the word to try to talk you out of something. The word to try to talk you into something. The word. Now, the land. It's uh, no matter how challenging and inconvenient it is for you and me to, to have to accommodate the divine requirements involved in taking the land. I want you to remember this. It is in there where your destiny is, in the land. It crossed over, going in the land's your destiny. <laughs> Not staying out in the wilderness. You don't have the option of saying, well, I think I'd stay, I'd rather stay out here in the wilderness. That's where I'd rather be. I don't think you have that option. If you stay in the wilderness, you're violating the divine intentions of God. And you're going to finish up a corpse out there in the desert whatever that may be, whatever it means. So that the giants may be tall and the walls may be high and the chariots may, may be equipped, equipped to cut you off at the ankles. You know, you've ever seen those with those sores on the wheels. Cut you right off. But your destiny lies inside there. That's where it lies. That's where, you, that's where the place of your rest. And God's not putting you in there to kill you. That's your property. He made you a bunch of promises. Now, whatever's required of going and getting it, do it. you got a legal requirement to go in and get it. You'll never be fulfilled until you get in there and get it. Your fulfillment is in there. What is that? Your fulfillment. Huh. Now, let's turn to Exodus chapter 23, verse 20. Exodus 23, 20. Exodus 23:20 20. Verse 20 starts out. Let's hear the word of the Lord, okay? Ready? Behold, I'm going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into a place which I have prepared. Listen now, be on your guard before him, obey his voice. Do not be rebellious towards him, for he'll not pardon your transgressions, since my name is in him. But if, if you truly obey his voice, and do all that I say, then, then I'll be an enemy to your enemies, and be an adversary to your adversaries. Whatever that might mean. For my angel will go before you. And he'll bring you into a land of the Amorites, the Hittites, Kerizzites, Canaanites, and Hivites, the Jebusites. And I will I'll completely destroy them. You shall not worship their gods nor serve them and do according to their deeds but you shall utterly overthrow them now you think on these things and break their sacred pillars 
in pieces, tear them up, burn them. But you shall serve the Lord your God, and He will bless your bread and your water. And I'll remove sickness from their midst. There shall be no one with stirring or barren, no miscarriage in your land, in your land. Why don't you say, my land, our land. Say, my land, my land, my land. Say, our land. That world out there belongs to us. Yes, and I think we're supposed to go get it. That's where we go in the land. Yep. I'll fulfill the number of your days. No premature dying. I'll send my terror ahead of you. And throw into confusion all oh, the people among whom, whom, whom you go against there. I'll make all your enemies turn their back to you. I do like that part. Turn their backs to you. Now the next one is just a, a kind of a, a rubber, a divine mischievous jab. You just, you, I'll set hornets ahead of you too. Ooh, hornets, they're mean. Oh, little hornets, huh? No atomic bombs, little hornets. Just jab you. If you have a thousand after them, after you, they'll drive you out. To Hittites and Canaanites and Jabberites. And, I'm not going to drive them out before you in a single year. But the land, that the land may not be become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. I'll drive them out before you little by little to become fruitful and take possession of the land. And I'll fix your boundaries from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines, from the wilderness to the river Euphrates, for I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you will drive them out before you. Now, the wilderness and the land, the wilderness, that was always something uncultivated in the Jews, Jewish language. The land is different. Bit by bit you cultivate the land. You don't let it become wilderness where jackals and wild dogs and everything else eat everything up. But he was bit by bit. He said he'd give it to you. Bit by bit. Now remember that. Bit by bit. Little by little. So you'd fill the land up. Takes those people out. Now, he'll give them to us as we drive them out. You may shall make no covenant with them now. Or with their gods. Don't do it. They shall be. They shall not live in your land. They're not going to live there. Lest they make you sin against me, the Lord said. For if you serve their gods, it will surely, surely be a snare to you. No compromise here. The land's a place of victory. If it's a place of victory, it's a place of conflict and battle. Remember that, those of you who are passive. It's also called the place of rest. That's interesting, isn't it? Rest, rest. Rest is not a sensation of activity. I think rest is a contentment in your vocation and what you're doing. You're not at peace in it. you got rest in it. You're at peace if you're doing what you've been called to do. Whatever that may be, that's your calling. Your grace has went on you. Now let's read the second one. Exodus 34. Exodus 34. Hmm. Here we go. Verse 10. Then God said, Behold, I'm going to make a covenant. Before all your people I will perform miracles which have not been produced in all the earth. Did you all hear that? Did you read that? Now remember what I said about surprises in my last teachings? Surprise God is surprises. He likes to surprise. He's going to dot the landscape with holy surprises. And assisted you and me to realize our, our vocation and potential in the land. He's going to do some tremendous things. He said so. Never been done before. Now never lose the excitement of God's independent right to intervene. Sovereignty. He does. Don't commit yourself to the idea that 
that you're you're doomed to a monotonous religious routine, a mess of God's the ultimate enthusiast here. He's exciting. God's capable of infinite excitement. When you read the Psalms about God going on a journey, and he rides a cloud and takes thunderbolt with his fist and goes shouting across the <laughs> sky. Now think about that. That's the symbolic way of saying, of saying God's exciting. That man's wild exciting. Dimsdale Young said an apathetic God would depress the universe. Now, if God got that depressed, it the universe. Now, he's the source of that in the universe. And you, have you been to church services that were just nasty? I don't mean nasty, nasty. I mean, there's nothing there. It's quiet and shy and no moving and boring and can't wait this to get over with, so forth, so on, so on, so on. That's not God. That's not God. That's why I quit the whole outfit in the very beginning. That wasn't God. I don't care how spooky you might have made it. No, I was a Catholic boy. And that was back then. We did, had Latin. <coughs> the services were kind of up and down, on your knees, back and forth. And I went, no, I, no, no, this is not right. This is not right. Now, they've gone through many changes. But still the same thing. Man-made. 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 God's exciting. He's very exciting. Don't ever lose that enthusiasm. Go and go get him. There are people who have looked at me and said, I've lost my salvation. No, you haven't. You need to stir things up. Stir yourself up. Stir your faith up. How do you do that? Praise the Lord. Worship God. I love you and I worship you and I praise you, Father. Thank you for the wonderful things you said in the Word. I don't care what my life looks like right now. Your Word says I'm healed by Jesus' stripes. That all my needs are supplied according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. All things have been given to me that pertain to life and godliness. I have power over all the enemy, over serpents and scorpions, over all, every one of them, everything. Hallelujah, Father. It's you. It's you. Now, let's stir yourself up. He's exciting. He's an enthusiastic God. He wants you to run with him that way. Now, he says this in Isaiah, The zeal of the Lord of hosts it's going to accomplish everything we're talking about. It's just that holy enthusiasm. Not by might, nor by power, but by that spirit, says the Lord. It gets into you from him. He, he, he's going to use you. He's enthusiastic. But don't do it boring, because you'll just tear people down. He always does abundantly above all that you could ask or think. He makes too much of everything. He's the God of the overflow, the over much. He's a philanthropic, magnanimous, prodigal God. He's the God that throws everything over too much he pours over now when he gave us the holy spirit he didn't dribble it out he poured it he poured it out he didn't dribble it out all of jerusalem heard it they all came running what is that they all drunk no we're not how many got born in five thousand at a time too many stars in the ocean too much water in the sea too many mountains in the range of mountains too many blades of grass in the lawn that's my boys he He's a God of too much. You leave something alone. He just grows and grows and grows. He's the God of the overspill. The overspill. Back to the old covenant. The covenant saith, my cup runneth over. Didn't he? That's why you have so many saucer drinkers. Cup and saucers. They're too lazy to get their own cup. So, that, so every time they see a revival, they run around and scoop somebody else's saucer up. Get your own cup. Overflow in that. Overflow, overflow in your own cup. Now let's start again at verse 10 again. <laughs> Behold, I'm going to make a covenant for the land. Before all your people I for miracles that have not been produced in all the earth. Nor among any of the nations. And all the people among you. Among who you live. Will see the workings of the Lord. For it is a fearful thing. That I am going to perform with you. Be sure to observe what I command you this day. Behold, I am going to drive out the Amorite before you, and the Canaanite, Hittite, Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite. Watch yourself, that you make no covenant of them. Don't you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land which you're going, lest it become a snare to you, a snare in the midst. You're to tear down the altars, and smell down their pillars, sacred pillars, and their ashes. They're, they're totem poles. You won't worship any other gods. 
No other gods. I'm jealous, he said. I have a, je a jealous God. Lest you make inhabitants of the covenant of the land, covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and sacrifice their gods, and, and they invite you to eat with their sacrifice, and you take some of his daughters for your sons, and the daughters play the harlot with their gods, and cause your sons to sin, and they play the harlot with their god. You shall make for yourself no molten gods. There's no question that we're in a big fight and conflict right now to the death, and we're not the ones going to die. There are institutions and projects right now today that have popular support that God has put the curse of death on them. They're gone. He's already breathed destruction into them from the very beginning. Now they're laying the seeds of their own destruction. It's right inherent in it. That you and I and us, the seeds of immortality and holiness, the spirit that's going to raise us from the dead, it already raised Jesus from the dead and dwells in us. We already have eternality throbbing within our breasts. Now that thing out there is dead. It's dead. It's cursed. It's dead. All that you and I are going to do is go in there and bury it. That's our responsibility. And a lot of people don't want to do that. They're just too passive. Numbers chapter 33. Numbers chapter 33. Number 33, let's turn in, verse, verse, verse 50. Then the Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan opposite, opposite Jericho and said, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them this, And when you cross over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their figure stones and destroy all their molten images and demolish all their high places too. You shall take possession of the land and live in it, for I have given the land to you to possess it, and you shall inherit the land by lot according to your families. To the larger you shall give more inheritance, and to the smaller you shall give less inheritance. Wherever the lot falls on them, well, that shall be his. You shall inherit according to the tribes of your families and fathers. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land, from before you, then it shall come about that those whom you let remain will become as pricks in your eyes and thorns in your side. They shall trouble you in the land in which you live, and it shall come about that as I plan to do to them, so I will do to you. Hmm. The land is a place of, of victory, and it's a place of rest. It's a place of fulfillment. Now let me read you this descriptive paragraph of what I mean. And I don't have time to go into all these points. I'm going to get them in your, in your notebooks if you guys are taking notes. So Israel, the land to Israel, it, it represented a place that stood opposed to Egypt, the land from which they were delivered from Egypt. It was rest from bondage. It was divinely provided freedoms from weary wandering. It was power over all their enemy. It was a place where God wanted to settle them permanently to realize their true destiny as a theocracy, to experience the outworking of his real in every area of their lives as individually and corporately. They would utterly eradicate the Canaanites and so remove the contagion of the Canaanite organized behavioral pattern of sin and demonic idolatry which was all over the land get rid of it now let me give you a simple proposition on this if the earth is the Lord's and we're to disciple the nations and we're to get the inheritance back and God has made all of these promises to us. We need to start laying hold of these promises and realizing that God intimidating that force out there that intimidates us, it's already been vitiated and reduced by God sovereignly. And he's waiting for us to get in and take over what he's already prepared. Now, you've got to start thinking about that and believe in it. 
You can't just hear it. You've got to start believing it. You've got to start doing something with it. There's a positive side to our faith and a negative side, too. The negative side is we've got to stop believing the pessimistic lies that came from the pulpit and teachings and what leaders have taught us about passivity, and you start turning it around. The world that you and I have to start to take over is no more rotten right now than it was Canaan when, when Israel went into Canaan. It's no more rotten. In a lot of ways it's less, but, you know, it's no more. The question about how bad it is doesn't enter at all into this. No matter of our success and in, in intention, and take it, God said, take it. That's it. Go take the nation. He didn't say, go look at it. It's so horrible. I don't think we can do it. Well, that's what the Ten said, and that's not good. That's not in discussion right now. God has already, by his sovereign purpose and works and what he did in Christ, God has already he softened the enemy up already for you to take him over. But you don't believe it. We, we don't believe it. That's why the first generation of Israelites, they didn't go into the land. They believed that God had had power to get them out of Egypt, but he, he had power to give them manna and clothes. But when they took a look what was in the land, they could not believe that the God had done everything up to that point could do what he said he could do. He just sent us out there to kill us. That's what he'd do it. No, the faith broke down. You stand out there. Your faith's not supposed to break down. And your faith is not supposed to break down. We hear everything. Get people complaining about everything all day long. Why don't you stand up for what's right? No. Uh, a little flock syndrome and the false modesty and the rapture. That's what we've seen that continuously for the last 40 years. I tell people to get into it. Now, there are, there are two options not available to you as a Christian. The rapture and retirement. They're not available for you. They will happen when they happen. And you're never going to retire. And you're probably not going to get raptured out of here like you think you are. You're going to take the land. Now here we go. Here's some points. It is a place of abundant provision. The land. It's a place for abundant provision. Exodus 3.8 It's a good land. A large land. A flowing, flowing with... Out of your innermost being shall flow. Flow. It's a land that's flowing. Not jerking around, not weird. <laughs> flow. Flow. Flow should become a significant word in, in your life, in your Christian vocabulary. Flow. Flow. If something isn't flowing, you need to suspect it in your Christian life. If it's not flowing, you're sputtering, spitting, you'll find out why. Why isn't it flowing? God's stuff flows. It flows. And if you're settling for less than flows, you've got somebody else trying to bless you. Flow is a mature word. Now he repeats that in Deuteronomy 11.9. A land flowing with milk and honey. In Deuteronomy 11.10. He said this. It is not as the land of Egypt. Covenant country is different than the land of Egypt. Covenant country, now you hear me, covenant country is not only different than the land of Egypt, it's different than the land of Egyptian Christianity. You've heard of Christian, just the Christian of Egyptian Christianity. And coin a phrase, Egyptian Christianity to me is this. It's equal to uh, carnality or pretty close to it. It's a Christian trying to be a Christian in Egypt. Covenant country is different. It is uh, not just the land of Egypt at all. It doesn't operate on worldly principles. It is not to be run like a worldly corporation. Everything in Egypt demanded human effort. The Bible said that uh, they watered it with their foot, like a, you know, a pump, laboriously. Where is that? Deuteronomy 11, maybe? I don't know. 11:10. You know, just 
and they watered it. Yeah, there it is. For the land of which you are entering to possess it is not like the land of Egypt, from which you came, where you used to serve, your, sow your seed and water it with your foot, like a vegetable garden. Now, if you've ever seen that, they still tour all day long. Had to do that. They were you were the pump. The land of Egypt is 500 miles long, and it it really exists along the the Nile River. The Nile River is a life source for Egypt. That's why the Nile is one of Egypt's gods. But it is a great long strip along the other side of the Nile. So you can take advantage of that that water, the river, moving and cargo and irritation or ir irrigation. And your irrigation system was huge. And they had pumping from canals to canals foot power. Now the land, God said, is not like that, God said. It is not like that. You don't have to pump it up into the next canal. It just flows. Flows. You don't have to work it. It just flows. Huh. Something to think about. Now let's take some Egyptian Christianity and look at it real quick. See the difference now. Uh, in Egyptian Christianity, you have to pump it up. You got to try to make it all work. Yeah, you liturgize it and you force it and you push it and you know, oh mm, my uh, or mm, we're trying to get a jerk out of it. Oh here we go, just a little one. Oh, if we could get a little blessing out of it, it's a little we want a little one, anything. Oh God, it's, I can feel it. You feel it? Oh. No, that's no. No, that's not what we do. Praise the Lord. Oh, you see a little trickle coming along the irrigation ditch. Here it comes. Now, when you come into covenant country, you don't have to bump it up. It's flowing. Open your mouth and it flows in the goodness of God. It's a flow, flowing country. It won't be like Egypt, God said, where everything has to be pumped up. When you come into covenant country, come into the land, the land is going to be something that God provides that flows for you. It has an abundance. You're not going to have to jerk it up, work it up, flow it up, push it up. and You just have to have the capacity to handle it. Foot power versus flow power. Are you able to handle what's coming? Now, foot power is laborious and limited and inadequate. You can only do so much, and that's it. And you have to work at that. It becomes, after a while, it's just a burden. Why are we here? I can't wait to get raptured out of here and just die. In Romans chapter 8, verse 2 and 3, it says, The life and the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the life of sin and death. For what the law could not do, that it was weak through the flesh, God did, said by sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And he condemned sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Yeah. Christ Jesus. That the righteousness of God might should flow through us. That the righteousness of God would flow through us by His Spirit. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. I, I want to get, get this point to you. It's not going to be by a lot of struggling. It's by obeying the word and flowing in the spirit. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Now, understanding that victory is it's a wonderful thing. Now, it's kind of a ridiculous story I'm going to tell you, but you're walking down the main street and there's a big skyscraper, about 10 stories, 11 stories, and some dumb guy trying to climb up the sheer wall of that skyscraper, his knees all torn up, his fingers torn up, and trousers are ripped up, and bleeding everywhere. Toes of his shoes are scratched up, from trying to get up there. And they walk up to him and ask him, well, what are you trying to do? I have an appointment on the 10th floor, and i got to get up there. And he's trying to go up that sheer brick wall. And I said, stop, ho, ho, there's an easier way. What? There is? Yeah. It's the law of the elevator. The law of the elevator? What's that? What's an elevator? Come on, let me show you. So 
So I take him inside, and he's all bloody and torn up and scruffed up looking. And I take him in the elevator and put him in it. And I said, okay, where do you want to go? He said, 10th floor. I said, push 10. Reach over there and push 10. He said, really? Yeah, push 10. Is it that easy? It is that easy. Now, that's exactly what I'm talking about to you. You and I are, are we have an appointment on the 10th floor, the land. You know, a lot of a lot of us, we, a bunch of us are trying to climb up the sheer walls of that brick. We're struggling and working and sweating and it's hard and we're bleeding and torn and, and inside the law of the elevator is working. But what the law could not do that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son and the likeness of the flesh. It condemned sinful flesh. Condemned it. And the condemned it. That the righteousness of the, uh, the law might be fulfilled in us who not walk after the flesh but after the spirit. Now this whole matter of worship, the whole matter of worship and flowing in the spirit, it, it may look ridiculous, but that's the release of the life right there in the worship direction. But in the same token, it is the same life force that you release in that worship, that you release into that land and that world. <laughs> well, let's just show you in the area of conduct and behavior. Now, we believe as we worship God and we flow in the Spirit that there's a, a real release. Of, and sometimes when we enter into high praise, and then we come back into the area of conduct. And we get into a whole different set of principles. And we get our face all screwed up and wrinkled. And we clutch ourselves and hold ourselves. But the same principle that's involved here is involved here. Worship. Conduct. It's real simple. It's so simple that we can't handle it too good. Boy, Paul said, I speak with those more than you all. Now, he was talking to a church where everybody talks in terms all the time. Corinth. Now, if he talked in tongues more than the rest of them, he might have stayed up nice talking in tongues. Get ahead of those old boys. Now, tongues important? Yeah, tongues are very important. He that speaks with unknown tongues speaks mysteries to God, and no man understands him. He builds up himself, he edifies himself, builds himself up. Now, if you're constantly flowing in the Spirit, moving in the Spirit, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spirits of songs, you're, you're very irritating. You irritate other people. <laughs> You'll irritate them. I'll show you. Praying in tongues, they'll think you're nuts. Well, I don't mind being crazy if I can be victorious. If you've done this long enough, it gets old being beat. Be crazy victorious than plain defeated. It's horrible. Uh huh, isn't it? Now think about this. Paul says it very simply. If we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, I'll guarantee you this morning there's a large percentage of us don't we don't well, we don't do that we reverse it and and preachers are largely responsible for it what have we top what have we top if you don't do this you don't do that you don't do this you don't do that then the Lord will bless you by his spirit that's not what it says it's not true if you figure it out finally not what it says if you walk in the spirit you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh Let's say there's a path in front of us, and one path here, one path to the right. Now, this is walking in, walking in the flesh. So, over well, there's walking in the flesh. And over there's walking in the spirit. Walking in the flesh is sleepless nights, cold sweats, convictions. I've done wrong, blah, blah, blah. Now, if you walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of flesh. I'm only one person. I can only be one place at one time. There are two paths here. So, that's the path for self-gratification over there. And this is walking in the spirit of the air. Now, I stand at the place of decision between them both. Flesh or spirit. What am I supposed to do? Now, what is a good religious Christian thing to do? What's the noble thing to do? What is it? The noble thing to do is to stand here confronting self-gratification and say with courageous conviction, especially religious conviction, I will not do it. I will not do it. I will not walk that way. I won't walk in the flesh. The Bible says I won't do it. I am not going to do it. I refuse to do it. But what do you do? You do it. That's what you do. You're going to do it. Prohibition is a wonderful thing. It makes you want to do it. It's just what it does. It accelerates that desire. It does. Now, my mother 
she used to put things away for the winter for us because it was snowing deep and uh, deer jerky we loved it and pine nuts and roasted pine nuts we had to sit around and crack those and eat those at times so she'd put them up and she'd tell everybody these are all put up here don't touch them and I, none of us <laughs> we were even thinking about it until she said something about it now it's on everybody's minds I gotta have me some jerky I'm gonna eat me some pine nuts we're gonna do it and for and you, you know, oh, see, you're being watched now. You know that God's watching you, whatever. <clears throat> for the next five minutes, everybody in the house became atheists. Period. And we all went hunting for that jerky and those pine nuts. Yeah. And you got to stay away from that because God's going to watch us. Hallelujah. Now, one of those types that walk in the Spirit all the time. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. They're just it's Psalms, they're singing some songs. And you talk to them, they say, glory to God, hallelujah. They're walking in the Spirit. They're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh because they're walking in the Spirit. And, and you know, and they're irritating. They've irritated me, but they're walking in the Spirit. And I've learned from them, and I learned how to do it. I learned how to speak in tongues and songs and spirits of song. You know, these people, I used to think, they're not very deep. They're just praising the Lord. They're irritating they're not deep like us, you know, like you and me. We're philosophical. We're in Jean-Paul Sauter and Shriver and, and uh, Watchman Nee and all the other Christian mystics that seem to solve all the biological drives and the spiritual heredity factors. No, and these people are just praising the Lord, but they're walking in victory in everything. We're deep and defeated. <laughs> no. They're simple people. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They have an interpretation from God about everything all the time. God's done everything. All we have to do now is praise the Lord. You make a noise unto God, that's all you can do. Now, that sounds slightly superficial to some people, I know. And hallelujah. And it's the Holy Spirit, the executive agent of the the Trinity, he wants to make me victorious and he wants to bring the entire community into the land to fill this world up with his presence and his ways with education educational excellence no lying, economic accuracy a political integrity, all of it, it runs through mankind, you don't become some kind of religious weirdo, this is our land it should be set up that way no lying no cheating. Do what the Word said to do. That's where He said to do. Take the land. Show them and disciple them. That doesn't mean to make a bunch of, of religious weird people. No. Each one has their own special gift and giftings. God calls everybody to several different things. Not everybody's apostles and prophets and teachers. And No, they're truck drivers and politicians and, and uh, teachers. Things that need to be. Now, I don't want to be unkind to people that are having all kinds of struggles and things. It, it comes. There's, I've seen, I watch healing. I watch finances. I watch things with Christians. And they, I knew they were walking the way they should be, but they're not copping out. They had some problems. They had problems with it individually. Now, I think corporately, you'll start to experience healing and prosperity, in my feeling, when we get our act together corporately. Now, recognize that we're the community that's going to have to govern the earth. You're not waiting for Jesus to come back to take over because he's not going to take over the earth like that. Is that right? Now, I'm going to stop right here. The land. Flowing with milk and honey. There's a strong distinction that people are going to have to make between the land is when Jesus comes back or we're going to the land of heaven. We'll go to heaven. That's the land. God made it very clear what the land was and how you're going to get there. Now, we're going to have a big problem with the corporate part. That's the problem that needs to be taken care of. I think on an individual basis, you can walk into the land. Oh, yeah. Because you can walk with Jesus in doing everything he told you to do. You do your part. Now, I know that will lead into the corporate aspect of it as well. If you, you could only do your part. You can't do Jim's or Mary's part. You can only do yours. Now, when Jim and Mary don't want to do theirs, then they're not going to join into the corporate part, are they? And they won't end up doing their individual part. They end up following as corpses out in the wilderness, whatever that may be. 
I've seen a lot of good people, a lot of good Christians, a lot of good folks die off early because they would not go in. They're good people. They wouldn't go in to do their prosperity part, do the part that they were supposed to do, whatever they might have been. And it would prosper and bring them into a place of peace. They were always in discontent because they wouldn't do it. And as, as a prophet, as walking as a prophet, what I have for, for many years, I would know quite often what they were supposed to be doing. But it wasn't my place to go tell them. It wasn't my place to just go, thus saith the Lord, you're supposed to be doing this. What are you doing that for? That was few and far between. They did happen, but it's few and far between. Uh, often God would use me to, to uh, verify something he told them to do, to lead them into doing things, certain things. You don't have to feel it to do it. You just go do it. My father told me to mow the lawn. I didn't have to feel it. You got to mow the lawn. He may not have felt like doing it at all. It doesn't matter. He had authority. He was buttering my bread and feeding me and taking care of groceries and so forth and so on. And that was all right. I could have said, well, you brought me into this world. You have to. That don't work that way. Honor, obedience, do what you're told to do. There's always good to come out of that. But your peace and rest will not come unless you walk in the land. Go into the land. Father, we thank you for this teaching. We ask you to, to bless people, help people understand it. I didn't teach it real good, but Lord, your word's true. We thank you in Jesus' name. This is Mike. Jesus is Lord. We'll see you next time.